Welcome to another Metal Detecting with Silvermane Digging Up My Ancestors edition. This time I will be focusing on my great grandparents, Henry and Teresa Detman. These great grandparents are special to me in that I was acquainted with them until their death at the age of 93 when I was 10 years old. In this video, I have numerous photographs, recollections from a still living family member, and a tour of an old house. So without a further ado, here is a synopsis of the life of Henry and Teresa Detman. Henry Oscar Detman was born October 5, 1883, in Kropelshagen, Lauenburg, Germany, the son of Johann Detman and Dorothea Fries. Not much is known about Henry Detman's childhood years, but early in his youth he had learned to play the harmonica. His father, Johann Detman, died on April 17, 1890, as a result of committing suicide. A few years later, shortly after his 10th birthday, on October 15, 1893, he, along with his mother, Dorothea, his brother, Ernest, and sisters, Frederica and Caroline, emigrated from Hamburg, Germany, aboard the SS Gellert to America, arriving at the port of New York on October 27, 1893. From there they went on to Wisconsin and settled near Loganville in the township of Westfield in Sauk County, where he would work as a farm laborer. After his mother was married to John George Hahn on August 17, 1894, at St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church in Loganville, Henry went to live with his sister, Carolina, and her husband, Henry Peen, in the township of Westfield, and then later in the township of West Point in Columbia County. While working at the Frank Patterson Farm in the township of Dane in Dane County, he met Teresa Neumeyer born November 5, 1883, the daughter of Joseph Neumeyer and Maria Anna Werla of Roxbury, Dane County, Wisconsin. Prior to meeting Henry, Teresa went to school at St. Norbert's Parish in Roxbury and worked in Milwaukee for a time as a servant and a housekeeper. Henry Detman married Teresa Neumeyer on February 28, 1908, at St. Patrick's Catholic Church in Lodi, Wisconsin. They had three children, Helen, Martha, and Herbert, in Dane Township before he bought an 80-acre plot of land in the West Point Township near Lodi to farm on his own on July 2, 1912. He had six more children, Edna, Verna, Walter, Dolly, Joseph, and William, a total of nine children, five girls, and four boys.
Recently, I was given a tour of the farm by Tom and Jeannie Detman, grandson and current owner of the Detman farm. The old house is still there, though moved a hundred feet or so from its original location, and is used for guests. Tom and Jeannie were gracious enough to give me a tour of the inside of the house. Detman was probably about the fourth owner of the fourth? house. Really? All our kids bring our junk here. Like they got a new big screen TV, and so they bring. Yeah. We're, so we got to get rid of all this. But wow. Um, this was the main living room. Correct? This was the main living room. This was your grandma and grandpa's bedroom. That's and this there. whole iron bed was here, and it might. I I think this might have been. I don't know whose bed it was, but it was. Huh. It was this bed, the neighbor lady gave it to me. Dolly had okay. given it to her and she brought it back to me and I just spray painted it and brought it back up. It's really nice. When we have company, we use these bedrooms for... Yeah. Oh, you were showing me this oh, down here under before. Oh, here. Yeah. Yeah, this is kind of neat. What people kind of really, you know, how they... How, oh, like, this says coffee. This is how they patch the... If, like it says right on there. What kind of it? Hills Brothers? Nope. Yeah. It's a brand I don't even know. Huh. It says something, well, it says here. It says coffee. Well, maybe that was how Hills Brothers looked back then. Okay, if you can lift that back and <laughs> do whatever uh, you want. We got it now. And that was their stove. That was and this was the stove that they had. Burn one on one side and gas on the other. Yep. You could burn wood. Okay. Hope you don't have a gas leak when you're burning the wood. No. That's what, they heated, that's what they heated this house with in the winter. Yeah, okay. this stove. But in the summer, the cook, they, they had a, they cooked out there. It was too and hot. That was the girls' room, and that was the boys' room. Okay. I thought that was the girls' room. No, but the girls got the bigger room. This is the girls' room. room, I think. Okay. So this was the girls' room. And all four would sit, four, five, four or five. Well, there was and, uh, five of them. Five girls in this room. Yep. And one closet in the whole house, and there it's back there. Edna, Dolly, Helen, Verna, and Matt, Mar Martha. Martha, yeah. That's five. Well, the wallpaper I used in is more recent. Are the yeah. furnishings a long time here, too? or No, the furnishings are things that I dragged in. I got this at a sale because I thought it kind of looked like the old house. Oh, front that, view. that was Doll and Doll. Got the craft room, dear. That yeah. Was, that was Doll's table. table. This was Doll and John's table. The Their table? Was. And those red and white chairs were Doll and John's. Oh, the portrait used to have a, used to have a bunch of your, your yeah. dad. And, and this was the boys' room. The How many boys in here? Five or well, no four. There was Herb and Joe, Bill, and Walter. Big enough for two sets of bunk beds, and that's about it, huh? Well, they didn't have bunk beds. He said the bed took up most of the room. He said it came to like here, and he said they they had a little dresser against the wall, but they just slid into bed and they had to sleep this way. Wow, one big bed. But this is all junk I had in my attic for my girls. Uh huh. And I just thought it's a good place for it. And they did use that for heat. Cute. Okay. I'm not sure if but the, when we came here, the plaster was just okay. falling off the wall in big cracks. So I, I, I put uh, that, that real thick plaster yeah. stuff on it just to hold it up. Looks good. Because it was. I like the pine cone oh. wallpaper. Yeah. And then this is the original stove? No. No, no, this well, is the original. This is the stove. That was in the cooking stove. They never had a stove so back then. Okay. No, Tom and I put that in there. Just they just heat with that. Warm. That thing would keep would roast this you on here. This was in our just, basement. Yeah. Oh, what a job to carry that thing up here. It's heavier than a. You wow. could hardly. It took five men to get it through that door. I thought they'd never do it. Wow. But they did. Is no. this a reminder of uh, behave yourself? My grandma always told me that whenever the kids got a line, she had like a belt strap or something sitting on the wall. Really? And all she had to do was point to it, and they knew when to behave. Mm -hmm. That's what my grandma told me once. 
I don't know if this was the place for it or not, but I was just curious. I have Don't no idea. Really. When we moved in here, it was just full of old junk that Johnny bought at auctions, and uh, it was full of. He was using it for storage. Oh, okay. It was. They that didn't. Room, there was grain in there. They just. Huh. Shoot, there were grain and pine cones all over. We uh, took bushels of pine cones. My grandmother and eldest daughter of Henry and Teresa Detman, Helen Geyer, remembered her parents this way. Well, Henry Detman, my dad, he was a good guy and liked to have people around, loved to play cards. You could get into a game any time he was around. He used to play the harmonica a lot, and could he ever play the old German songs a lot better than the ones he learned here? This is Tressa Neumeyer Detman, my mother. She was a good hard worker, but us kids had to help or else, which was good for us. Made us lots of Cracker Jack, by the dishpan full. Yeah, that's right, lots of ice cream. We had a little freezer that we had to buy the gallon freezer full of lots of other goodies. Fed us good farm food, all had our chores to do, and no one tried to get out of doing them. No fighting, we knew better. There was a strap hanging by the cupboard, which I don't think or remember she used, but it was a good reminder to all of us. She was super. How she ever did all she did, I don't know. For 50 years or more, Henry worked hard doing farm work. As his youngest daughter, Dolly Mitchell, remembers. Well, we always had hay and oats, and that, the oats made straw for the bedding and corn, and we'd shred corn in the winter time. I can remember going to the cucumber patch and picking cucumbers and to the and they raised green beans for the factory some, and I picked green beans. And green beans. <laughs> I think we raised sorghum. That was before my time, because I can remember Herbert telling about he had to take it way over here beyond Sauk City to have it sorghum made. It's like a a corn. It's a stalk like a corn, and we and they refined okay. it and made like thick honey. In his spare time, Henry liked to play his harmonica or play. A game of cards such as Euchre, 500, or Sheep's Head, while Teresa liked to tend to her vegetable and flower garden. Every year after Christmas time, Henry would take a train at New Year's to Reedsburg to visit his mother and his brothers and sisters for a couple of days every year. A neighbor did the chores on the farm. Henry and Teresa would stay on their farm until 1949 when they rented it to their youngest daughter, Dolly, and her husband, John Mitchell, and later selling it to them in 1955. Henry and Teresa went to retire to Lodi, Wisconsin, where they spent the remainder of their lives living into their early 90s. Teresa died on January 10, 1977. Henry followed a short time later on February 27, 1977. Besides four sons, Herbert Detman, Walter Detman, Joseph Detman, and William Detman, and five daughters, Helen Geyer, Martha Nelson, Edna Millis, Verna Kep, and Mary Adeline Dolly Mitchell, they had 21 grandchildren and 25 great-grandchildren, of which I am proud to be one of them. Now on to the metal detecting portion of the video. Well, here we are at the Detman farm. We're going to give it another shot and see if we can find a coin today or some other relevant artifact. If I find anything, I'll let you know. What you see here is the original dinner bell, which with all 11 kids would be called for dinner. And I don't know if it has anything on it anymore, but... Uh, looks like New York on one side, but I can't tell what's on the other, but down here we have the uh, one of the cooking pots, the original cooking pots that my great-grandma Devin fed the kids. So it's just kind of an interesting thing. So get back to you if I find anything. Here's the most intriguing find of the day. I have no clue what it is. Um, you got me. I thought it was a jar lid at first, but it looks like something 
and you guys can tell me, I would appreciate it. I have no clue. <laughs> we'll get back to you if I find something good. Well, looks like we got some kind of partial token here. Uh, don't know how old it is, but it's got a star-shaped void in the middle of it, and I only got a part of it. Hopefully I can find maybe the other part close by. Uh, we'll get back to you if I find anything else. Well, looks like we got some kind of silver plate spoon. Uh, we have some markings on it. Uh, might date back to the time. Could be one of the spoons that uh, my great-grandmother had. Uh, more than likely. Well, what we got here is a shotgun shell. Not an unexpected find, since also my dad used to hunt here. So, don't know how old it is, but it's a find. Get back. Well, we got a door hinge here. That was easy to identify. Well, we got something good. It was... Looks like another lantern part. Not to be unexpected at an older spot. But it came out real good. I thought I had maybe an Indian head, but... Uh, I'll take it. It's a nice find. Yeah, what's any farm without a little mason jar lid? I was expecting one of these sooner or later. They always sound like a good silver coin, but false signal, but nevertheless, a find. Get back. Well, we got a little wearing apparel thing, a zipper. Yeehaw. Well, after much digging, I found a harmonica reed. Something I thought I would find for a while, so... Good find. I'll get back. Finally, something decent. We've got a buckle. Belt buckle. Ah, uh, good find. Don't know who it belongs to, but I'd say it's fairly old from the looks of things, so I'll get back to you if I find anything else, but that's a good find for me. Alright, get back. Here are the results of the Detman Farm Hunt. It's pretty much just a lot of rusty junk. Uh, as you can see here, just a lot of unidentified rust except for that hinge and uh, the most common find would be these most common on any farmland mason jar lids well over a good dozen of them so we got basically trash but there were a few treasures on this hunt uh, I wouldn't call this a treasure it's basically some unidentified piece of brass over here we've got several bullet cartridges some never fired um, thought that was interesting uh, some other cartridges Winchester and two others um, typical find I would say on a farm too uh, here we have what looks like what could be a partial token I'm not sure but it has a star shaped void on it some kind of bolt. Here we have a lantern piece. Nice find. Here we've got a belt buckle. Over here we have a few wetsits with a zipper. And what I consider two of my favorite pieces from this particular hunt is this harmonica reed. Mainly because I know my great grandfather Henry Denton played the harmonica quite regularly. So I think it could be either his or one of his kids, but who knows. The other one is this uh, silver plated spoon. It's made by it's Rogers. I don't know if it's readable or not with this camera, but it says Rogers 1881. So it's the only item of this particular bunch of stuff that has a date. But that's about had it for the last three hunts, but I've got two other finds that I have found in the past about four years ago and one of them being of a particular interest to me and then we will get to those next. Of the hunt of the Detman farm four years ago the results were pretty much the same as it, as it was in this video but I did find my only old coin and one of the two items I have saved is this just a simple wheat penny dated 1916 and there we go. See the wheat back. There we go. And this is the wheat back. I guess you could say that this particular coin is a testimony to my great grandfather Henry Detman's 
ability to hang on to his money. He was probably fairly frugal and made sure he never had a pocket drop because I should have found several more coins than this. So it certainly has been a challenge to try to find one. Now for the next item, and I would say is the best item I've ever found metal detecting as far as non-coin items, and it's my favorite relic, is this piece. You can see that right there. It has, and without the light shining just right, I can, you can see that up here it says H. Detman, Lodi, Wisconsin, D.E. Wood Butter Company, Evansville, Wisconsin. So not only do I have his ID on a piece of metal, but I also have a little bit of Wisconsin history here. And what was this tag used for exactly? Well, I can only guess, but I would imagine it was used with one of these, a milk can. What would probably happen is when uh, Henry Detman would fill it up, he would have them come and pick up his milk can, take it down to Evansville, and then bring it back when they were done with it. So now on with a little bit of the history of the D.E. Wood Butter Company. The D.E. Wood Butter Company of Elgin, Illinois, founded by D.E. Wood in 1868, owned several creameries in Illinois and Wisconsin. He sent his nephew, C.J. Pearsall, to manage the Evansville plant in 1891. By 1894, the company was so well established that D.E. Wood purchased the Evansville building, shipping a railroad carload of butter each week. The company operated out of the old creamery until 1897 when they purchased the land and building of the old tack and match factory on the east side of Enterprise Street. Most of the products from the Evansville plant were shipped to the eastern United States. But in November 1904, D.E. Wood had also found a market for its butter in England, shipping over 400,000 pounds of butter to the British markets. The number of people employed in the plant grew as the company expanded its markets. The first of the two major fires hit to hit the building was reported in May 1906. The building had once been the old tack factory was entirely engulfed in flames. It was several hours before the fire was under control and the company began to estimate its losses. The fire damage was $15,000. The company decided that they would rebuild that section of the building. The brick portion of the building survived the fire. The butter making machinery was still intact and after a cleanup was complete the company resumed business. In 1915, the company was producing nearly 4 million pounds of butter in a year. The company was so successful that it became the target of a buyout offer from a national company. The Pearsall sold the firm to the Cudahy Packing Company in 1918. The First World War brought a strong demand for oleo margarine by the federal government, and in 1918, the company began to manufacture this product. Oleo margin was sold under the brand names of Anchor and Rex. To accommodate these new products, an addition was made to the west side of the building in the summer of 1923. It housed cream, creamery, offices, and storage. The old building was remodeled with new machinery for manufacturing margarine. The company expected the new processes were would require the addition of about 100 employees to the workforce. The demand for milk had risen so much that the local firm was having milk shipped to Evansville plant from northern Wisconsin and Michigan. It was a great benefit to the farmers and that the company purchased whole milk and cream throughout the year and arranged for delivery to the plant. Milk was brought to the factory by local drivers who traveled their country route in all kinds of weather. A second major fire caused a shutdown in operations at the plant in October 1928. The fire was put out rather quickly. The fire was a setback, but the local plant was cleaned and restored for production. The company's losses were set at more than $13,500. Despite the success of the company, a state tax on margarine had a disastrous effect on the local plant. Because of heavy lobbying against margarine by the dairy industry, 
the state of Wisconsin added a 10 cent tax to each pound of oleo margarine. This made production at the plant in Evansville unprofitable and the D.E. Wood Butter Company closed its doors. The last shipment of margarine left the plant in early June 1931. Well, here we are at the place where the uh, Deadman name flight came from, and it is the D.E. Wood Butter Company out of Evansville, Wisconsin. Uh, we found a little bit of history about the place, and I was looking online and I was able to find the original edifice of the structure, or part of it. As you can see here, this is the Butter Company. Hard to read, perhaps, unless I get real close, but there it is, the D.E. Wood Buttercup. So that's it. The D.E. Wood Butter Company sent out its drivers to see Henry Detman's business in Lodi, right? Not quite. I think we have another piece of evidence here. A piece of equipment I found on the Detman farm that adds more to the story. Yeah, it's just a water pump, but it has something very interesting. Another Evansville connection. One I'll have to research. There is not enough time to give a detailed history of Baker Manufacturing Company, but it was first organized by an Alan S. Baker and Levi Shaw on October 1872. Its original purpose was to manufacture rotary steam engines, but that project was dropped due to inefficiency. Its foundry was built in the fall of 1873 and put into operation in the winter of 1874 with the manufacture of iron water pumps and this iconic piece of farm equipment, the windmill. Under the trademark monitor by Baker, a Civil War veteran who was enthralled with the innovativeness of the battleship monitor. In 1893, Baker Manufacturing was awarded a gold medal for excellence of design of its windmill, which was erected at the World's Fair Exposition in Chicago. Since then, the Baker Manufacturing Company has been known for a diversity and a variety of products such as water system components, gasoline engines, walking and acrobatic toys, hydrofoil boats, an anti-aircraft lead computing site, an average protractor for matching aircraft propeller blades, and other scientific instruments. Baker Manufacturing is still going strong in Evansville, Wisconsin to this day. Here we are at Baker Manufacturing Company, and this is where the water pump and windmill came from that my great-grandfather purchased. It is also, I believe, connected with the D.E. Wood Butter Company in that uh, when farmers would come down to pick up their uh, equipment for the windmill, that the D.E. Wood Company, Butter Company would uh, come to confer with them for milk or butter or eggs, whichever. So uh, here is Baker Manufacturing from the far end. And we're Baker Manufacturing, which made the windmills and the water pumps. And we swing over, and where do we have but right over here, if you can see it close enough, if I zoom close enough it is, there's the D.E. Wood Butter Company. As you can see, it's right next to each other. In the conclusion of the matter, I'd just like to know how a business from Evansville goes 51 miles up to Lodi to find business for my great-grandfather. It's just fun, and I, I also like to know the history of an object that I do find. And uh, how many of you guys out there, the metal detect, can say that they have found an object with their ancestor's name on it? And uh, all you people out there who love the metal detect, I encourage you, if you know of a place where an ancestor is from, go metal detect it. You never know what you may find. This is Silvermane saying, may all your finds be silver. Get out there and see if you can learn a little something, something of your family history.